something, you know, before I die. So I just started trying to do rolls with my feet, you know, anything just to kind of survive. And then he gets, uh, I can see then, you know, he gets really annoyed and I see him reaching into his pocket. And then, you know, I see the drum key. And then he kneels down and starts taking, start taking my double bass drum pedal away. Boom. And then uh, he like steps back and then looks at me and with a big smile, he says, now, solo. <laughs> so I had basically no drums had left to solo on, you know, I thought. And, you know, I, it's, I sounded and I felt like I had just woken up from, from a stroke. And I had been in a coma for 10 years. I, I couldn't do anything, you know, it was incredible. And then I started looking again, you know, I was sweating and I started looking at the faces of the kids that were playing with me and they looked so happy. <laughs> you know, like bastards. They, they really were enjoying the moment, you know. So it was brutal. Uh, and then I remember <laughs> he said, okay, trade choruses. I'm like, trade choruses? I don't know what the hell is that, but okay, whatever, you know, so. I'm playing, and then they're all telling me, solo, solo, solo. So I start soloing, and then, like 32 second bars, uh, 32 uh, bars later, everybody comes in at the same time, like a chorus later. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Why are they playing? I, I was playing. <laughs> and then, okay, so then I start playing time, and then 32 bars later, everybody shuts up at the same time. And they're looking at me like, solo, solo. I'm like, what? I mean, I was so confused. I had no idea what was going on. So this ass whooping went on for two hours. And after two hours, my ego was not as healthy anymore. I was very hurt inside, actually. And, um, you know, the ensemble was over, all the kids left, and I was there putting away what was left of my drum kit. And then the teacher was still there, and he saw me that, you know, I had a really depressed look on my face. And he said, you know what, L let me talk to you for a second. I said, yeah, okay. So, wh what do you listen to? I'm like, well, you know, I listen to um, uh, Rush and The Police and uh, Chicory Electric Band and Alan Holdsworth and, you know, all, the, all this thing that were really fusion -y, you know. And he says, oh. Okay, now I, I can see what the problem is. You know, you this is a bebop ensemble. And you've never actually heard bebop before, have you? I'm like, man, nah, not really. And I said, okay. So let me just give you a bunch of records to listen to, you know, and then maybe you can study with me next semester. And if you want to learn bebop and jazz, this is the right way to do it. I'm like, cool. You know, so he started giving me a bunch of discography to listen to. And I remember one of the first things he recommended was a record uh, of Miles Davis' quintet uh, called My Funny Valentine 4 and More. It's a live CD, uh, well, live album in a Town Hall in New York in 1969, I believe, with Tony Williams, who was 17 at the time. You know, and I remember when I put that record on and I started listening to Tony play, it was the same feeling I had the first time I heard Ringo play, or the first time I heard Neil Peart or Stuart Copeland play, or the first time I heard De Wacko and Vini play. You know, it was that kind of like, oh my God, this is something amazing and special. So, you know, I listen to that record, I still do, you know, for, for inspiration. And Tony Williams, you know, is of course one of the, the greatest drummers that have ever roamed this planet. And he was 17. You know, at that time, that's that's obscene. That's not cool. You know, <laughs> and here I am, just trying to to learn a little bit of what these guys were doing. But you know, I think I'm the living proof that it doesn't matter where you come from. You know, if you want to learn something and you feel it deep inside your heart, you can do it. You know. I did not grow up listening to jazz. I did not grow up listening to bebop or swing or anything. Uh, I acquired the taste later. In the beginning, I didn't even like it. But I think, you know, drumming started getting so exciting 
to me, just drumming itself, that that started leading towards jazz. Why? Because ja jazz implies improvisation. You know, I, I just wanted to explore as much as I could of what the instrument could do by itself and also with a band. But like I was saying in the beginning, I learned it the hard way. You know, because I was uh, at Berkeley and I was one of the guys that had the most technique. And, you know, at Berkeley you had all these this, uh, people that needed musicians and drummers for, for ensembles, for recordings. You know, it's like a micro-universe at Berkeley. There's, I mean, back then there were like 350 drummers. Right now I think there's over 500 drummers over there. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a micro-universe, but it's a lot of competition in that place. So I remember I was you know, checking out some European drummers. I remember there was a Danish drummer, a, S a Swedish drummer, uh, that they played really simple, you know, like a lot more you know, cool, you know, not, not, not so much like wild energy, but very, very cool. And I remember they would be getting called all the time to play with, with people, and, with, and I was like, man, there's something that I'm not getting. Obviously, you know, because I have the technique, but I started learning that having technique with no concept, no musical concept, is like giving a machine gun to a five year old. You know, it's a powerful weapon, you know, and if you're not careful, you can shoot everybody in the band with your bad taste and your horrible, you know, ch uh, choice of ideas. You know, if you only have technique and you don't know how to use it. So, you know, one of my biggest advices to you is don't waste time on just playing drums. Get your technique together. That's very important. You always need your technique. Um, because there's also the other kind of jazz drummer nowadays, I think, that have almost no technique. And they say, oh, I don't need technique because I'm just all about music. That's cool. Maybe, maybe, and they can be very musical. But I think there will be times when you're playing music that you will need to go into that, you know, fifth gear. You want, you want to play something really fast. I mean, just listen to, um, I don't know, Kid Jarrett or Chick Corea or Miles Davis. Miles Davis, in the end, he was playing very sparse. He was playing very few notes. He would choose his notes very well. But in the beginning, he could play bebop like a madman. So he could do it. He just chose not to do it. But whenever he needed to do it, it was there. So as a drummer, that's what I want. You know, I, I want to have the facility in my hands and in my feet to do whatever I want. But I just choose not to do it fast all the time. You know, I just choose to play it musically. And to me, that's the secret of this instrument. You know, like I said, we have a lot of power over the music. So you, it's very easy to overplay if you have technique. And um, it's also very common in this instrument to, you know, we practice by ourselves and we're just practicing patterns all the time. So what happens sometimes is that you're working with a band and you're maybe in a little bar, you're playing jazz, nobody is really paying attention. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna practice that stuff I was doing yesterday. So, okay, lick number two. Ah, didn't work out, let me, let me try it again. Another two times, you know, because nobody's listening. So then you, you take that as an as, as a, a opportunity to practice, you know, and I, I think that's wrong. I think music, you have to be in the moment, always. It doesn't matter what kind of music you're playing. Uh, but that's the hardest thing about it, and that's the hardest thing about jazz, to be in the moment and make every moment completely unique. Even if we're playing the same song, the way we'll play it tomorrow will be completely different than how we played it yesterday. Why? Because, you know, we're affecting each other musically. You know, if I'm hitting this symbol and I hit this symbol instead, if I'm writing on this and the sound changes, maybe that will give the bass player, you know, a different idea of what to play, and then the bass player will affect the piano player, and then the piano player will affect the sax player. I mean, it's all like a chain reaction. But we can all change 
you know, at any given moment, the direction of the music. And to me, that's the coolest thing. You know, uh, it's like, a, you know, you guys like soccer, right? You, you have a good soccer team, Sweden, so-so, <laughs> just like Mexico, so-so. Yeah, one good guy. Yeah, in Mexico, we have a couple of good guys. But, uh, but you know, you know the game, soccer. So jazz to me is like soccer. Like when you're playing really, you know, a team that really knows how to play soccer, like, you know, somebody has the ball and they pass it around and then they pass it around and then they score the goal. You know, to me, playing with musicians is like that. You know, the sax player is soloing, but that doesn't mean that he is the only one that has the ball all the time. You know, so if you guys have ever played soccer, you hate playing with a guy that always wants to keep the ball, right? I mean, you hate that guy. I hate also the sax player or the piano player or the guitar player that never shuts up. You know, that is always soloing and when, whenever he's soloing, he never leaves any space. You know, because to me, space is the equivalent of passing the ball. You know, the sax player is playing, but boom, he leaves space and then he passes the ball. And then I play something and I pass the ball and the bass player plays something and they pass the ball and the sax player keeps playing. You know, so it's interplay all the time, just like a good sports team. To me, that's, that's uh, where jazz is at its best. So, you know, I've been very lucky that throughout many years I've been playing with really great musicians that play this way. You know, with that kind of being in the moment mentality. And that has made me grow immensely, you know. Uh, and I think one of the secrets to growing quickly as a player is always playing with people that are better than you. You know, that will kick your ass every time you play. And in the beginning, it was hard for me, you know. When I started getting better to the extent that better people started calling me, yeah, I, I was sweating all the time. I remember when I was playing um, uh, with this great uh, piano player from Panama. His name is Danilo Perez. He plays with Wayne Shorter. He's been playing with Wayne Shorter for a long time. And I played in his trio for, for many years. And I, I was not used to playing with that intensity. You know, I came from Berkeley. And yeah, you know, I was in the moment, I thought, you know, and I was trying to be uh, super focused. But, you know, when I started playing with this guy, and we started touring a lot. I mean, you know how you set up with a, a piano trio where you have the piano on this side and the bass in the middle and the drums, you know, on the other side. So the piano would be there. I would be facing the piano player. So we'll be playing and he would be just looking at me like that the whole time, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. You know, it's kind of scary. And then, you know, he, he would just start jabbing the piano and I was like, okay. Should I, you know, I, I was not used to that intensity at all. And after every gig, I would have the biggest headache because I was not used to being that focused, you know. But after playing with them, I was like, wow, you know, I feel like my, my level of, of uh, concentration and focus started growing a lot. And also another thing that helped is that we were playing in front of people that paid money to see us. So if he's playing an amazing solo, and then I have to play a solo, and there is, you know, a hundred or a thousand people watching you, that puts a lot of pressure on you, like good pressure. And that kind of pressure, you either sink or swim. And I was lucky enough that I was at a, at a good level that I, I swam, you know, I, I, I didn't sink. Um, so that made me grow a lot very quickly. So uh, maybe what I would like to do now is play a little bit. Uh, so there were some people